Does it come to a time when then you graduate from school or settle there or here? Mm -hmm. How how does it then move yeah. from from yeah. from that point? Yeah. yeah. So I graduated um, mid two thousand and two. Mm -hmm. And had obviously, even before graduation, started to explore what are the opportunities. Yeah. And um, I, it essentially came down to three choices. Mm -hmm. So one was to stay in the UK and take on a youth pastor role. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't, attra I, it just didn't sit as this is my passion, That's this is what, what I want to do. Yeah. It didn't feel like my, my purpose. Mm -hmm. um, Another option was to work for Balcraig Foundation, the mm -hmm. foundation who ran um, the, the children's home. Mm -hmm. um, but it sat already by that point very uncomfortably with me to, to be part of an organization that was working in communities here, but based elsewhere. Mm. That dynamic of, of somebody calling the shots who's so far removed, not just geographically, but contextually, culturally, even just language wise, like it, it it just, I have a, a depth of understanding, I think, today as to why that's extremely unhealthy. <laughs> but already at that point, it felt wrong. Um, and the third option, um, my, my grandparents were in the process of transitioning out of Bernardo's. Mm -hmm. At that point, they had experienced so many people. Bernardo's has quite a reputation mm -hmm. in Nairobi. So mm -hmm. they had so many people who would come and ask for assistance. And at that point, their policy was that they couldn't help anybody who wasn't part of the Bernardo's community. Mm -hmm. um, and that for them didn't sit right. Mm -hmm. And so they um, transitioned out of Bernardo's and mm -hmm. founded Vision Africa mm -hmm. um, to be able to help other communities mm -hmm. um, with resources that they could raise. And so mm -hmm. they would raise from churches, from their friends, mm -hmm. from their own networks and um, funds and resources that would allow them uh, to engage, um, not in a very structured way, mm. <laughs> but they built classrooms, they mm. ran feeding programs, mm. they did a number of different things. And mm. one of the things that had um, kind of become obvious to them as, as a pressing need mm. was um, out of school girls. Mm -hmm. And that was before free primary education. Mm -hmm. So we had many girls who mm. hadn't even fin finished primary school, mm -hmm. definitely couldn't go on to secondary school. Mm -hmm who were out of school and um, either working in exploitative environments mm -hmm. or not working and, and just struggling to survive. Mm. Um, and many girls who didn't have the opportunity to continue their education. Mm. And so they, by that point, had formed a board and, and set things up um, a bit formally. And, and the board approached me and said, would you like to come and start something for these girls? Mm. And they said, we don't have any money. <laughs> we mm. can't pay you anything, mm. um, but we can give you a place to stay and help you figure it out. Mm. Um, and I, after a lot of back and forth, um, very naively, mm. <laughs> um, I really had no clue what I was getting myself into, but mm. I said yes. Mm. Um, and I remember sitting with the chair of the board, um, his name's Bob, and um, he said, we want you to sign a five year contract. Mm. And in my head, I'm thinking, are you mad? I'm not going to live in Kenya for five years. <laughs> I'm going to do a couple of years and then I'm going to come back home and get a proper job. Uh, and so my intention was to, to go back. Um, and of course, that was uh, 19 and a half years ago. Mm. <laughs> and not only have I stayed in Kenya for those 19 and a half years, I worked for that organization mm. in some form or another mm. for about 15 of those. Mm. <laughs> so. Um, so, so yeah, I, I said, I'll sign a two year contract and, and take it from there. Mm. Um, and I'll never forget. I remember the night before I left, um, it was around the early September 2002. Mm. And I remember being with my mom in my bedroom. She's helping me pack and organize my things. Um, and I guess I was just having these last minute questions and doubts. Is this really the, the right decision? Um, am I crazy? <laughs> the, uh, and I remember my mom saying, um, basically, you'll be fine and you never know, you might end up just staying there. Mm. Um, and whether she knew, whether she had a sense that I was headed in, in this kind of direction of, of where my career would actually take me, um, I don't know, but she seemed to just have this peace and this confidence that mm. you'll go and you'll be fine and actually it's the right place for you to be. Mm. Um, and that was a huge encouragement um, as I was going. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I ended up then here. Mm. Um, and then when I got here to kind of start figuring out how do we help 
girls. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, kind of some basic research and assessment showed that and we didn't know free primary education was coming. Yeah. So we thought if we start a secondary school, because that mm. was part one of our initial ideas, mm. um, it might end up being hugely inefficient because mm. we'll take all of these girls through secondary school, but still at the end of secondary school, will they have skills that make them employable? Mm. Will they have skills to start enterprises? Mm. Um, will they have the life skills that we need? Mm. Or actually, should we look at an alternative pathway mm. that sets these girls up quickly because they're struggling to survive, mm, <laughs> sets mm. them up quickly mm. um, with the skills they need to be able to earn a living, put mm. food on the table, mm. take care of their families and mm. um, that kind of a thing. And that's where um, the Seed of Hope project was born, was born. Um, because we started on a vocational training mm. program. So Seed of Hope was born under Vision Africa. Yes, yeah, right, right, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Um, and it got its name because mm-hmm. there was an old gentleman who had a seed factory, actually mm-hmm. in Comorock, mm-hmm. who wanted to donate the factory, but it had all of this huge tax mm. bill. I mean, it was a bit messy, mm-hmm. let's just mm-hmm. say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we didn't take it up, but mm. because his factory there had been a seed factory, mm-hmm. we decided to call the girls project Seed mm-hmm. of Hope. Mm-hmm. Um, and so yeah, Seed of Hope started with four girls. Um, I yeah still remember that the day that the four girls first showed up, it was mm. a residential program, mm. so they would come stay with us. Mm-hmm. At that point, for three years, it later became two years, mm. um, and we lived together. And if I'm very honest with those four girls, we figured it out together. Oh my goodness! <laughs> because I was the one writing curriculum, yeah. designing organizational policies. Yeah. Um, figuring out how to employ people, mm. what do we need to do to be like compliant mm. and not get ourselves in trouble? Mm. Mm. Um, how do we find other stakeholders in mm. the space? How mm. do we connect with mm. them? Mm. I was very green. Mm. <laughs> what period is this? So that was late 2002 and mm. um, through kind of 2003. Mm. Um, and we walked with those four girls mm. for really the first um, six, seven months of 2002 mm. um, and then took in, I think it was about another 20 girls the mm. end of 2003 mm. and then Scaling. that began this kind of cycle mm. of every mm. year taking in, mm. that was the Nairobi Center, every mm. year taking in, mm. um, well eventually it became about 100 students every year. Who's now, um, who's supporting, so I've, I've got two questions for you, mm. one is, is uh, f- just to contextualize, have you now then permanently relocated to Kenya? Mm. Um, I didn't think I knew it, but yeah. I guess I had. Yeah. <laughs> so in my head, I never expected to stay kind of for the longer term. Yeah. I definitely felt like there was a sense of purpose and meaning in what I was doing, mm-hmm. that it was building on all of these other experiences mm-hmm. that I had. Mm-hmm. I loved being here. I loved just the work that I was doing. I, yeah. I mean, it felt right. It felt mm-hmm. like I was in mm-hmm. the right place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm hadn't answered all of those questions of Mm. what does this mean for me as somebody who's not Kenyan? What does Mm. this mean for me as um, a fairly fresh graduate? Mm. (laughs) How does the theology and the justice and the development pieces fit together? Like I was still figuring all of that out. In Mm. some ways, I guess still am. Mm. Um, But as I say, there was a very strong sense of of kind of purpose Mm. uh, and Mm. meaning in what I was doing. we made mistakes along the way. It was yeah. a huge learning curve. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it, it was it was an amazing journey. Yeah. Uh, the the skills I learned along the way um, carry me through Have to where I am to, today. <laughs> to, to continue building. Yeah. You, that's what you've been building yeah. on. And whilst we were under the umbrella of, of Vision Africa. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was my grandparents. They had one or two others who helped them on the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, and me, so we we didn't have this huge pool of expertise within mm-hmm. our organization and funding. No, we didn't have. As I had to fundraise. <laughs> that, yeah, that was my second question. Yes. Like, where where was the where were the resources coming from for yeah. for this? Yeah, so it was my job to fundraise for mm-hmm. it as well. Mm. Um, At that age, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And to be honest, it was mostly kind of community-based fundraising. So it ah, was through the church. I was going to ask and, the model of, yeah, of, of resource mobilization that um, you were using at the time. And because, I mean, I think still at that point, I didn't really understand this international development space Field, or even yeah. that it was a space. Mm, mm. <laughs> I knew that in some other part of Nairobi, there was like the UN mm. and there was this huge community of like expats, mm. but it wasn't a community I'd connected with and it mm. wasn't a space I understood at all. 
And so how I knew to fundraise, and I guess largely because this is what I'd seen either through my grandparents or with others was mm. from friends, from um, church, from events, from like yeah. rotary clubs mm. and girl guides and all of those kind mm. of pieces. And, mm. and so that was how we mm. fundraised. And we called it fundraising at the time. It yeah. was it was just that. It was fundraising. It was, it was an, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. a new business development and, no. and, and, and resource mobilization. No. It wasn't those huge tabs that we now know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And we started with a very low budget. Yeah. Um I mean we rented a house. As I say, I stayed with the girls we brought into mm. the program. Mm. Um I didn't have a salary as such. Um as I had a few people from my home church who kind of sponsored here and there. Mm. Um I think I it allowed me to have an allowance of I think it was about 15 to 20 Jews a month and mm. um, so it wasn't a huge mm. a huge but it put food on the table mm. I was young free and single mm. I wasn't worried about paying anybody's school fees mm. <laughs> um, mm. so I guess I, I was comfortable even though the income wasn't mm. wasn't huge mm. um, and I think because there was a, a bigger sense of calling around All what right. was I doing mm. I wasn't driven by mm. by money the necessarily money. yeah yeah um, uh, and yeah, and we met along the way um, a couple of people who yeah. I, today I would call high net worth individuals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wouldn't have called them that back then, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who were able to kind of write bigger checks mm. and, and invest a bit more mm. uh, deeply. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, that building those relationships mm. became an important part. Mm. Mm. Um, and eventually my grandparents <laughs> decided to retire from their retirement because mm-hmm. <laughs> they mm-hmm. were doing all of this in their retirement. Yeah. And so they decided to transition back to the UK. Mm-hmm. And then I took over mm. uh, the kind of reins mm. of, of all the work that Vision Africa was doing. Mm. Um, it was a little kind of scattered and informal. Mm. And, and so a lot of that work um, was really around formalizing and mm-hmm. um, setting structures in place, putting policies in place, mm. ensuring this proper organization around staff and programs. Mm. We were able to define kind of four clear program areas we were working on at that point. Mm. Um, one was Seed of Hope and the work with girls. Mm. Um, one was um, children's homes. The other one was schools for children with special needs. Mm-hmm. Um, and the last one was education. Mm-hmm. So some scholarship, sponsorship programs, mm. after school programs, mm. feeding programs, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Mm. Um, and that brought its own trouble. Um, this was now around 2008, 2009. Oh, okay. Um, because, mm. yeah, in formalizing those operations, um, we found, of course, there were people who were taking advantage of the disorganization. Mm. <laughs> um, and yeah, we had to fire a couple mm. of people. We mm. we um, were taken to court. I mean, there was just mm. trying to, I guess, I don't know what the best phrase to describe it is, finding people who were doing the wrong thing or stealing money or, mm. <laughs> and then trying to fight that mm. um, by putting systems in place. Mm. Um, and we thankfully won all of those battles mm. because we were on the side of <laughs> of doing the right thing and, mm-hmm. and putting the right systems in place mm. um, but it was a difficult couple of years mm. just trying to figure that out and um, negotiate that um, just seeing the right thing done pushing mm. back on, on pe- and not letting people continue to steal or take advantage and mm. um, even though they've been doing it potentially mm. for a number of years and, mm. and um, yeah making sure things are done the right way mm. I guess took mm. its toll <laughs> for a while mm. <laughs> um, so, so yeah definitely mm, a huge mm, season of growth mm, mm. <laughs> interesting 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 and in those days i was still dealing with the joys of um department of immigration and work <laughs> permits and so everything was kind of based on these like two-year cycles of i have a work permit so i'm here for the next two years they, would, and that kind they of <laughs> grant you for how, how long did they grant you so they for? typically i'm not so familiar with the system now but then would typically mm-hmm. give work permits for one or two years okay Right. Um, and always on the basis, I think rightly so, that mm-hmm. you're training somebody else, mm-hmm. that you're mm-hmm. not taking a job away from a Kenyan. Mm-hmm. Um, so just this continuous effort to prove mm. those things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I guess life happened in kind of like two year cycles, mm-hmm. as I say. Mm-hmm. Um, Seed of Hope was growing. Mm. Um, we, within the first two years, um, decided to open our second center, um, which was actually in Kisi. 
Um, so we opened a center in Namache in, in QC and um, mm -hmm. so spent a lot of time traveling back and forth. Mm. Um, I used to take the old Akamba buses <laughs> overnight <laughs> yeah. and sleep in the bus station in QC until daylight arrived and then yeah. hit the road and begin to work. Yeah. Um, we didn't have a huge budget so that yeah. was the... <laughs> that was the life, that <laughs> yeah. was the way to do this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we grew to Kisi, um, then to Moranga, we opened a center in Moranga, mm. and then finally in Kitui. Mm. Um, so we had four centers, mm. um, overall working with a couple of thousand mm. um, young people mm. um, every year. Mm. Around 2007, 2008, mm -hmm. um, we began to ask ourselves whether we needed to open our doors to mm. boys as well as girls. Aha. Uh -huh. Um, for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. One, we would have these amazing young women who would come through the program, graduate, um, start doing amazing things and then get distracted by a boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it began to become apparent that we couldn't like revolutionize the mindset and skill set of girls mm -hmm. and leave the boys behind. Yeah. Um, because then there was a mismatch when yeah. the girls went out and looked for a relationship mm -hmm. or eventually marriage and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a big piece in kind of spurring us on to think about boys. Mm. Um, and another one um, was the post-election violence in mm -hmm. uh, 2007, 2008. Mm. And just recognizing the hopelessness amongst mm. so many young men mm. who sadly, it seemed at the time, were willing to go to the streets and risk their lives mm. um, for a small fee. Mm. <laughs> um, and not even a fee that would put food on the table for a month, a mm. fee that would just put food on the table for one day. Mm. Um, and recognizing the just the lack of opportunity, mm. lack of empowerment mm. across the youth, mm. whether it was girls or boys. Mm. And that yes, girls face very particular gendered barriers mm -hmm. to their education and progress, mm. but that there's huge barriers to boys as well. As well, yeah. And so we opened our doors to boys mm -hmm. um, and opened our training courses to boys. Um, it was interesting because then we had traditionally done training courses like um, hairdressing and fashion design um, home care. Um, and so then we started doing things like carpentry and, mm. and mechanics, but not restricting one or the other to boys and girls. To either. Um, and so opening that up. And, and mm. I remember we used to quite often kind of survey our students and just get a sense of like how they were growing, developing, what was happening, how they were feeling. Um, and I remember after our first year of having male students um, serving and um, asking, I can't remember how we phrased the question, but mm. what had changed in their kind of perceptions about their own lives and futures since they began at Seed of Hope. And one of the things that stood out from the boys' responses was, that they now understand that women can be leaders. Mm. And that's never something we had had as like mm. an objective or mm. an outcome. Mm. We hadn't necessarily been working towards it. Mm -hmm. But I think just building this environment where everybody should be empowered, where everybody had this equal opportunity. opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> um, and where we did have women in leadership mm. because we had previously been a girls project. Mm. Um, and just the way that that in itself shifted. Yeah young man's mindset yeah. I think was quite um, yeah. unexpected and yeah. a nice surprise. One of the unexpected outcomes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm. yeah. Um, mm. Those across those kind of four or five years mm. between 2002, 2008, I guess six years, mm. um, is when I met my husband. Um. <laughs> As you move into that, <laughs> yeah. that would be an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Let's take a quick commercial break to change battery and then sure. we'll, we'll come back okay. to that's where, where I met my husband. Yeah. <laughs> 